Hello, my name is Logan Hilberry. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'll be telling you about some work I did while at the Colorado School of Mines. The title of my talk is Quantum Cellular Automata Part 1, Entanglement, Physical Complexity, and Goldilocks Rules. To start, I would like to talk about complexity. When I say complexity, I'm referring to physical complexity. I'm not referring to the notion of algorithmic complexity, which is the study of how many steps are required to complete some algorithm, nor am I referring to just some complicated system. Now, the physical complexity, which I am referring to, doesn't exactly have a universally agreed upon definition, but I'll do my best to give you one sentence. Complexity characterizes a system of multiple individuals which may interact in many ways, resulting in collective group behaviors. One can think of many examples which fall into this paradigm. For example, humans could be the individuals, friendships make up their interactions, and their group behaviors are encoded on the social network over which those friendships are defined. Another example comes from the field of engineering where transistors could be the individuals, conductive wires make up their interactions, and the collective group behaviors could be something like a central processing unit of a computer. An important feature of the complex systems which I'm describing is that complex systems balance trade-offs. For example, between generality and specificity, robustness and fragility, or activity and stasis. An important abstraction in the study of complex networks is that of network analysis. Individuals could make up the nodes of a network, their interactions could be encoded in the links between those nodes, and the group behaviors could be quantified with network measures defined over those weights. For example, node strength is the sum of all of the link weights on a specific node, and the distribution of node strengths can quantify the presence of hubs in a network. For example, in a food web, there is a broad node strength distribution, which signals the presence of hubs, which are species which are critical to the functioning of the food web, and if removed, could cause the collapse of the food web. Disparity is a network measure which quantifies the backbone-like structure of a network. In this example, we see the metabolic pathways of various biomolecules taken by cellular organelles. So there's lots of ways for a certain biomolecule to be metabolized, but there's a strong backbone like highway over which that biomolecule travels in its path through metabolism. Another example network measure is clustering. Clustering quantifies the tendency of a network to form tight knit communities. And for example, is high in social networks where my friend one and my friend two are likely to be friends themselves. So let's look at a particular case of a system exhibiting physical complexity that's quite simple, and that's the classical elementary cellular automata, or ECA. In this system, the individuals are 1D bit strings, the bits of a 1D bit string. The interactions are encoded in a local transition function, which takes as input the state of a neighborhood and gives as output the state of the center site in that neighborhood. And group behaviors are encoded in a simultaneous global update. That is, the local transition function is applied simultaneously to all bits of the bit string. With three inputs and one output, all of which are 0 and 1, there are 256 possible local transition functions, which can be simply enumerated with a rule number r. Let's look at a few examples of the outcomes of these rules. So rule 90 generates this fractal known as Sierpinski's triangle. Rule 30 is capable of generating encryption quality random numbers. And rule 110 is capable of universal computation. So to quantize this system and generate our quantum cellular automata or QCA, we first trade bits for qubits. So a discrete space, state space of zero and one becomes a continuous state space of the block vector on or inside the block sphere. The local transition function is traded for a double controlled unitary gate in which rather than setting the center bit of a neighborhood to zero or one, we perform some operation on the block vector and that's encoded in the unitary operator V. And the simultaneous global update is traded for 
even odd site circuit layers. If we follow through this procedure, the 256 classical rules, which we distinguish with a C to remind us that they are the classical rules, become 16 quantum rules, which we distinguish with a capital T to remind us that three sites participate in that double controlled unitary gate. In the next talk, my colleague will describe the F rules in which both the nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors constrain the update of a center site or five sites. Let's take a closer look at this double controlled unitary gate. We see that it involves the sum over the local state space of the left neighbor as well as the right neighbor. And the center site has an operation of this form. The CMNs are either zero or one and come directly from the rule number. And the matrix power V to the CMN is either the identity if C is zero or the operator V itself if C is one. And we see that in other words, the neighbors decide whether the center site is static or active. And so let's look at a few example rules to understand where there is a trade-off which can be balanced in order to generate physical complexity. Rule T0 in which all of the CMN are equal to zero is trivially always static. It always applies the identity operator to all the qubits in the lattice. Rule 15 is similarly trivial in that it is always active. It will always apply the update operator V without any respect for what the neighbors are. If we further constrain or allow updates, we arrive at the near Goldilocks rules, T1 or T14. However, we might say that these rules are either too cold or too hot. In other words, too static or too active. The balance point of these rules occurs for rule T6, which is active if and only if the neighbors are in opposite basis states. We call this rule the Goldilocks rule because its activity versus inactivity is just right. I'll also describe what I'll call a far from Goldilocks rule T13, which has high activity like rule T14 plus a broken symmetry. And we'll see that this rule generates behaviors which are the furthest from the Goldilocks case. So I would like to show you the results of some simulations. And so I'll give you the setup of those here. We initialize the lattice with a one centered in a C of zeros. The boundaries are similarly fixed to zero. As the local update operator, we use a Hadamard gate, which will transfer a block vector on the z-axis to the x-axis. And we repeat this process normally a thousand times, but I'm excited to say that today I will share some brand new data in which we repeat this process for 10,000 time steps. So even more data to share. At each time step, we record the quantum state of the system psi. That state can be used to create the pure system density matrix rho, which further can be traced out to define the state of a mixed subsystem. From those subsystems, we can calculate expectation values. And as we'll see, that will give us an analog of zero or one that we saw in the classical ECA case. Similarly, we can calculate the quantum entropy of a subsystem. Here, I show the equation for the von Neumann entropy, which we'll use to quantify the entanglement between the subsystem and the rest of the lattice. So let's look at a few outcomes of simple one point observables. On the right, I show the local von Neumann entropy. And on the left, I show the local magnetization, which is the analog of zero or one that we saw in the classical ECA case. It is the far from Goldilocks rule T13, which we see quickly equilibrates and remains equilibrated at late times. The near Goldilocks rules T1 and T14 remain somewhat dynamic at later times, but it's the Goldilocks rule T6, which remains very dynamic through all of the times that we simulated through in these simulations. So let's make the connection back to complexity science by considering networks. We will create a network 
called the Mutual Information Network, which is calculated with the local von Neumann entropy of a qubit, as well as the two qubit von Neumann entropy. And it's combined in this form to create a two index object, which we will interpret as a network. This quantity has the feature that it upper bounds all two point same time correlators of the system, as well as the classical version of this measure has been used to quantify complexity in the brain. Now, the important thing about a complex network is that it is neither uniform like this network created by a GHC state, nor is it random like this network created by the state of some random point in Hilbert space. Instead, we find that the networks generated by quantum cellular automata are in between these regimes and therefore complex. It is the far from Goldilocks rule T13, which is the most like a random network. The near Goldilocks rules appear less random and it's the Goldilocks rule T6, which has the most unique structure that we see here. So let's quantify the structure of these networks using network measures. First, we show the node strength probability distribution. We see that rule six has a broad distribution signaling the presence of hubs in the network. For clustering as a function of time, we see that the Goldilocks rule has a high value for all times. The far from Goldilocks rule is the most like a random network, which is shown in the black line again. For disparity, we compute disparity, but then further compute fluctuations of disparity. This quantifies network reconfigurations. That is, a system which has large fluctuations in disparity is undergoing many reconfigurations, first exhibiting a strong backbone, and the next moment exhibiting less of a backbone and continually changing that structure. We see that it's the Goldilocks rule T6, which has the highest fluctuations in disparity. We also can show that these results in the long time average of clustering and disparity fluctuations are robust to system size. As system size increases, the Goldilocks rule maintains the highest long time average of clustering and disparity fluctuations. We can show our results are general if we change the local update gate from a Hadamard to a Hadamard times a phase gate. The phase gate rotates the block vector around the z-axis by an angle epsilon. We see that in the long time average, it is still the Goldilocks rule T6, which maintains the highest clustering and the highest disparity fluctuations for all angles epsilon. Additionally, we can show our results are generalized to various initial and boundary conditions. Each column of this figure reports on a different boundary condition. The first, where boundaries are fixed to zero, as we've been discussing so far. The middle, where boundaries are fixed to ones. And on the farthest right column, we show the results for periodic boundary conditions. The horizontal axis on each of these plots describes a different initial condition, which works as follows. Each site is initialized to either a one with probability P or a zero with probability one minus P. And we compute the subsystem density matrices for each initialization and average those results for 500 trials. And as a function of the probab probability P, we see that it's the Goldilocks rule T6 which tends to maintain the highest clustering and disparity fluctuations for nearly all values of P. The notable exception is at the highest entropy state in which there is equal probability of setting a initial qubit to a one or a zero. So in conclusion, quantum cellular automata, as we have defined them, are simple one-dimensional quantum systems. Goldilocks QCA are those rules which balance activity with stasis. And furthermore, Goldilocks QCA are those that can reliably generate physical complexity. I would like to earnestly thank my mentors and collaborators for this work, and I thank you all for your engagement. 
If you need more QCA, check out part two of this series and also check out our archive paper, which is listed here. Thank you very much.